Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to today's episode of Talking Points. I'm your host, Syed Niaz Ahmed. As usual, we have got a very distinguished guest in our studios today. Uh, she is Ruhi Hamid, and she is a filmmaker. She has worked with some of the big names in this country. She has produced 15 to 18 films, short and long, and over two decades in this country and overseas. She attended the Royal College of Art, studied designs, and liked filmmaking so much, and of course, shooting so much that she has devoted her life. Welcome to the show, Ruhi. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. Thank you very much for making time for us, despite the traffic congestion yeah. in central London. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a <laughs> thank you. Uh, you started your film career uh, you, after you graduated from the Royal College of Arts. You went and worked in Holland and then somewhere in Zim, probably in Zimbabwe. Yes. Uh, what were you working on in, in Holland and Zimbabwe? Well, um, at the Royal College of Arts, I studied graphic design. Mm -hmm. And so obviously my interest was in design and I was trained as a graphic designer. And I got a great opportunity to go and work for one of the top design agencies in Holland called right. Studio Dunbar. Mm -hmm. So I went there and for two years I worked there as a graphic design doing all sorts of things like designing the science system for the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. um, to doing other exhibitions, books, book design, all sorts of things really. Right. And for me, you know, after college, that was an, a great opportunity to get right. experience See. in right. the field. See. And in Zimbabwe? And Zimbabwe, likewise, I continued. Um, you know, I grew up um, in East Africa, mm -hmm. and I, I always have an interest in Africa. So I like going home. I like going home, yes, I like going home to Africa. So I went to work there just soon after Zimbabwe was independent, five years into its mm -hmm. independence. Mm -hmm. And it was a great time to be there because mm -hmm. um, they were looking for non-white people to be doing design work, advertising, everything. So I was working with a former um, college colleague of mine mm -hmm. and we set up a design studio together. And again, we were doing all sorts of things from campaigns against um, um, apartheid mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. um, campaigns to raise awareness around HIV AIDS to blood donation. Um, we were working with children on workshops. We were doing everything and anything that was possible in the design field. Right. Uh, and when did you move uh, into filmmaking and what attracted you to it? Well, um, the, the reason I moved into filmmaking was because um, when I was at the Royal College of Art, in our second year, we got one term where we could go into a different discipline. Mm -hmm. And I chose to go into the audiovisual department. Right. And I made a three-minute film about the South African mine workers. Right. This was during the apartheid era. And I was so seduced by the moving image Did on a big screen. Did you go to screen. South Africa for that? No, I didn't go to South Africa. I worked with Im uh, images that was, uh, at that time it was apartheid and mm -hmm. I didn't want to go there because right. I didn't want to break the cultural boycott. Right. So um, I, I gathered archive images and I, I made this kind of three minute powerful documentary about their, their lives. Mm -hmm. And so that was so attractive to me. And then when I was in Zimbabwe, I remember we, I was traveling um, around the country and it was evening time and we were coming towards this village and I saw this flickering light. And as we got closer, I realized it was a television and the whole village was sitting watching this television collectively. But unfortunately, the, the stuff they were watching was American sort of soap operas, like mm -hmm. Dynasty and Dallas mm -hmm. type thing. <laughs> and when I saw that, I thought, what a shame that they're watching something like this. They should be watching something that would be much more to do with their something, lives. Something educative. Educative, exactly. And I thought, hmm, I, I would like to make documentaries and films that would make a difference to people's lives in the developing world. Right. So what I did was I came back to England and um, I decided that I would um, try and get into the BBC right. as a graphic designer first mm -hmm. and learn the trade through being a graphic designer, and, which is what I did. I worked as a mm -hmm. graphic designer for seven mm -hmm. years in mm -hmm. uh, the BBC News and Current Affairs Department. Right. And then I, I did lots of title sequences, and I learned the trade that when way. When did the real brick uh, so then I moved, come in? Yes, I, I was uh, lucky enough to get um, uh, chosen to do a trainee assistant producership in one of the sister departments. Mm -hmm. So I started working in the BBC's Community Programs Unit. Right. Um, and I, my first film was about Africa, as it happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was called One Day in Africa. And I filmed with uh, a Tuareg nomad in Mali. 
Yes. And uh, so that was my start in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Did you go to Mali? Yes, yes. I went and spent a month in Mali. How did you find these uh, very famous, uh, this very famous tribe, this Tuareg? The Tuareg. Yes, it was uh, interesting because we wanted to get to see different types of Africans' lives. So there were six of us, and mm -hmm. we all went to different countries. So someone went to South Africa, someone went to Tanzania, Uganda, um, uh, Egypt and and I went to Mali and my um, mission was to find the Tuareg nomads so mm -hmm. I traveled all the way to Timbuktu and then found this character who was uh, the chief of uh, a, a little group mm -hmm. and so it was something like um, about 25 miles outside of Timbuktu in the middle of the desert mm -hmm. and so that's how I found them and then I spent three days with them in the desert. Did you move with them? No, they at that point they had arrived at this one place <laughs> and it was coming up to Eid mm -hmm. so they had settled at that mm -hmm. point um, and I remember I was filming there and uh, I filmed the whole ceremony of them doing the the slaughter of the sheep and mm -hmm. it was all wonderful so they had a celebration on the day that I was filming. Well it's very really strange because of or rather coincidence that after two days we are going to have the same celebration yes. of Eid and slaughtering of animals. Exactly, it? almost. Sacrifice, so, yeah. the spirit yeah. of sacrifice of Abraham. Yeah. Uh, you were also involved in Africa in 2012 on a, on a project in Somalia, I thought probably a UN project? Yes. Yes, I decided to take some time out from broadcasting in Britain and uh, I was asked to head a team of um, people to make documentary films about Somalia for the UN. Mm -hmm. It was all part of the UN and African Union forces work in Somalia in trying to, um, well, basically um, the development of Somalia. There had been elections the year before and a new president had been sworn in. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I went there to make documentaries to show how Somalia was basically, um, you know, coming back to becoming a normal state because after two decades of war, it had been a failed state. Yeah. And so we were doing everything that showed the new development of um, Somalia as a nation. Right, I, I have met a number of people who go from this country to that country and, and they make films for United Nations and that probably geared towards the, uh, the need whether this country does deserve some foreign aid or not, or some UN aid, or UN help or not, mm -hmm. probably like that, see. Anyway, <clears throat> one of your very famous films, that An African Journey, was with the great Jonathan Dimbleby for BBC Two. Tell us something about that. Okay. How did it come along and when was that? Yes, um, so that was in 2009 and it was in the run-up to the World Cup in South Africa mm -hmm. in 2010. Um, and so the BBC decided that they would like to make, well, they were making lots of documentaries about Africa in general because the spotlight was on South Africa, but they wanted to show the whole continent. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan Dimbleby, who, as you know, had filmed in Africa for many years, um, he always felt that he wanted to tell the other story of South Africa, uh, of Africa. When he was there, he was always there in a news capacity, mm -hmm. covering wars and famines and corrupt governments and the fall of presidents, etc. All, all kinds of disasters. All kinds of disasters. And he felt very strongly about the fact that every time he was in Africa, he met wonderful people, and he thought that Africa had great potential, but it was never shown on, on the news channels. So he said that I want to make a journey through Africa to show the other side, the exuberant, dynamic, wonderful side of um, Africa. So it was a three-part series. The first film was in West Africa, um, mm -hmm. uh, and another director made that one. There was three of us directors, so we were given a film each. Um, so the first one was in West Africa, and my film was to cover East Africa, starting in Ethiopia, Kenya, and then Tanzania. And of course, as you know, Ethiopia was very close to Jonathan Dimbleby's heart because he had been there during the first famine and he was the, he was the journalist to break the news about the famine right. in, in Ethiopia. And so we, he wanted to show Ethiopia beyond the images of, you know, famine-stricken children to show that there is actually, it's a, it's a country that is on the move and doing some amazing things. So, but we went back to the very place where he had um, originally filmed the famine. 
So it was a very interesting journey going through the whole of East Africa, you know, traveling by road quite a lot of times, um, sometimes taking flights. But on the whole, we tried to do a real physical journey through these three countries to show how these countries were developing and meeting very, very dynamic young Africans who right. are achieving great things. And, you know, the continent is changing. Right. Uh, you have also produced a film uh, which is called Riot and uh, Revolutions. A kind of BBC thing, isn't it? Yes. In 2012. Uh, we'll talk about that and also, but I want to talk about your partisan films. Mm -hmm. That's uh, your baby, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a documentary film for, I mean, documentary filmmaking company. Yes. And uh, you make films for the British, uh, European and American and uh, uh, broadcasters. And you ran this, uh, this, you run this company with your husband. Yes. who's also a filmmaker uh, and a music professional. And what a shame that I, I didn't know that until a few hours ago, so yeah. I would have invited him to yes, <laughs> probably sometime in future. Yes. Uh, you had another film called Wall to Wall. No, 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 that's, oh, that's, a, that's, that's a name production for company. company. Yes. yes, yes. It's uh, Women, Weddings, War and Me. Maybe right. you're thinking of that. Uh, how, how, how do you manage this uh, partisan film, I mean, and when was it established? Okay, um, uh, my husband, uh, Misha Maltsev, and I set up this company about uh, four, five years ago, actually. And we set it up as a company to try and do our independent projects, as well as doing projects for the BBC Channel 4, etc. Mm -hmm. Because quite often, we're interested in stories and places. The BBC um, or, or Channel 4 are not? That are not interested in. So what we do is we do our own films in our part-time, just for our own satisfaction, mm -hmm. and to take to film festivals, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So Partisan Films um, was set up purely to do that. But at the same time, I get commissioned by um, other production companies in London. Right. Um, so I work for various independent British um, uh, production companies, mm -hmm. and they will commission me to make a film in uh, about a certain subject. And um, generally, they come to me because um, I have specialized in working in the difficult parts of the world, right. the dangerous parts yes, of the world. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, that uh, all this uh, work takes you to some of the flashpoints. <laughs> and uh, you go there quite often. And in, like you, recently, you came to, went to Pakistan, see, which is particularly right now is in a very volatile situation because there's a lot of demonstrations and, and agitation against mm. the government of the day. Uh, also, it's the same story elsewhere in, in most of the developing countries, see, even, even Hong Kong. Exactly. It, it's, things have erupted, but uh, we do not know. Uh, we'll take a break now, and uh, when we come back, we'll definitely talk about partisan films and, and how you run it and uh, how do you work with your commissioners. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us, uh, viewers, and when we come back, we'll talk to our distinguished guest today, Rohi Hamid. Okay? Don't go away. Come back soon. Apnara Dikchen, Talking Point. Shoujunne, Mahbuben Ku Accountants.